with undergraduate degrees in physics from MIT, English at UC Berkeley, and French from the Sorbonne. Her PhD thesis used one of the first working millimeter wave interferometers in the world, which is the now extinct Owens Valley Radio Observatory Millimeter Array. She was the co-discoverer of the first protostar at submillimeter wavelengths 25 years ago when she was a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. She continued her studies of protostars at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and as a physics faculty member at UC Riverside. Currently, as a principal investigator at SETI Institute, she is working on infrared searches for young, free-floating planets using the Hubble Space Telescope and the Keck Telescope atop Mauna Kea. Um, the array can image, let's see, the, the Atacama large millimeter, sub-millimeter array called ALMA is right, is a massive <coughs> consists of 66 radio telescopes operating as one. The array can image radiation from astronomical sources over the entire 0.3 millimeter to 9.6 millimeter wavelengths at unprecedented sensitivities. The instrument is located at 6, 16,500 feet elevation in the driest desert on Earth, the Atacama in Chile, providing maximum transparency through Earth's atmosphere. Our speaker will present a brief history of millimeter, sub-millimeter wave astronomy and its seminal contributions to our current understanding of star and planetary systems formation, both in our galaxy and in other galaxies. This will set the stage to put it in context, the remarkable groundbreaking results Alma is revealing. And I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to Mary Barsony's presentation tonight. Join me in welcoming her. So good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So it's a great privilege and pleasure to speak to you this evening um, to introduce you to what I believe is uh, not well enough advertised amazing results from this um, not so new <laughs> facility we have now called the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array or ALMA for short. Um, so tonight I'm going to restrict my discussion to the field of star and planetary system formation. And even so, we'll only have time to give you just a taste of the scientific results coming out of this instrument. ALMA is unique in providing the exquisite spatial resolution of Hubble at unprecedented sensitivity in a region of the electromagnetic spectrum that is quite unfamiliar to the general public, namely the millimeter and submillimeter. On this title slide, you see a picture of Alma in the lower right corner. Uh, that, whole, that whole array um, is Alma. Okay. And uh, along the top, there are three images. Um, the intent is that by the end of this talk, you will gain some insight into what these images are and what they are revealing about the processes, processes of stellar and planetary system formation. So why the millimeter submillimeter? Why are astronomers interested in the millimeter submillimeter wavelength range? First. It is only at these wavelengths that we can see through the darkest and densest interstellar molecular cloud cores where stars and planets are forming. As you will see, interstellar dust, which is mixed with cold molecular gas in our galaxy, absorbs and scatters light at visible wavelengths, making it impossible to peer into regions of star formation directly. Next. Sites of star formation are so deeply embedded in dusty gas that even light at infrared wavelengths, which penetrates further than visible light, also cannot pass through unimpeded, whereas millimeter and submillimeter light can. Finally, sites of star formation are so very cold at temperatures of minus 440 to minus 420 Fahrenheit that their thermal radiation peaks at wavelengths of hundreds of microns with substantial amounts of light being radiated at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths, with essentially no emitted light 
at the wavelengths visible to our eyes. So these three images of the same object illustrate the points made in the last slide for why we do millimeter, submillimeter astronomy to study star formation. Pictured here at three different wavelengths is an object known as Barnard 68 from that astronomer's catalog of dark nebulae from 1919. We also call this object B68. It's in the southern constellation of Ophiuchus, just 410 light years from Earth. Its actual physical dimensions are of order a tenth of a parsec, or um, a few uh, 0.3 light years. Half, okay, half a light year across. I don't know why I did that in my head. It's right there. For half a light year across, equivalent about uh, to about 12,500 astronomical units, or the Earth-Sun distance, or about two trillion kilometers. So that's what the dimensions of this thing are across. And it contains a mass of about two solar masses of gas and dust, just 1% of which is the dust. So what are the biggest differences between the optical near-infrared images of this object and its submillimeter counterpart? There are no stars in the submillimeter, you'll notice. <coughs> the submillimeter light is an emission radiating its heat, whereas the optical and near-infrared light is an absorption or scattered. In the left-hand visible light image, B68 is entirely opaque. You cannot see into it or through it. In the middle image, taken at wavelengths longer than our eyes are sensitive to in the near-infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see into and through most of B68, but not through all of it. Uh, let's see, what is this? So like right there and there, you see there's no background stars even in the near-infrared. No light comes through. Notice that the light of the background stars is dimmer than it would be in the absence of any intervening dust. This is known as absorption in astronomy. Notice also that the background starlight appears redder than it would in the absence of the intervening dust. This effect is known as reddening. Its physical cause is the preferential scattering of shorter wavelength or bluer light by dust. Shorter wavelengths are scattered more than longer wavelengths, so the background thermal emission from hot stars appears redder than in the absence of dust. Finally, the image at the right was acquired by the Herschel submillimeter satellite above the Earth's atmosphere at a wavelength of, at a wavelength of 350 microns. This is in the submillimeter. The false color image shows the intensity of emission from cold dust from B68. The color scheme for the submillimeter light is arbitrary. However, the color red signifies the most intense emission, yellow and green progressively less intense emission, blue the least intense detectable submillimeter emission, and the purplish black blotches are pure noise. Since B68 is extremely cold, 16 kelvins or minus 431 Fahrenheit, most of its radiation is emitted at 181 microns with substantial radiation being emitted at wavelengths as long as 350 <coughs> microns, the wavelength at which this image was acquired. Note from the optical and near-infrared images that essentially no light at these shorter wavelengths is emitted by this object. So here's a schematic representation of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, showing the location of the submillimeter and millimeter regions. Right, right. The expanded portion is of the region to which our eyes are sensitive, as well as the two neighboring ones. In the 1860s, James Clark Maxwell united centuries of observations and experimental results on electricity and magnetism in just four equations. These equations describe all electrical and magnetic phenomena, and they predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves as well as the speed with which these waves travel. That's the speed of light, about 300,000 kilometers a second, or 186,000 miles per second. Our eyes have evolved to be sensitive to just the small sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum, which happens to be the peak of the sun's um, energy output. 
the so-called visible light or optical spectrum. For reference, the smallest object our eyes can resolve is about a thousand nanometers, or a micron, less than a hair's width. Thus, the wavelengths of visible light are of order four-tenths to seven-tenths of less than a hair's width. Optical telescopes were invented, as you know, in the early 1600s, and Galileo was the first one to point a telescope to the sky. Telescopes have two great advantages over observing with what astronomers term the naked eye. They collect more light, therefore enable us to see objects much, much fainter than our <coughs> unaided eyes can see, and they increase the resolution or detail over what our eyes can discern. For about 300 years or more, until 1933, only optical wavelengths were used to observe celestial objects. Then, in 1933, a young radio engineer working at Bell Labs in Holmdel, New Jersey, was tasked with identifying sources of interference to the possibility of using short waves, wavelengths of 10 to 20 meters, or equivalently 28 to 14 megahertz, for transatlantic radio telephone service. He built the di dipole antennas pictured on your left. That's that's Jansky in front. They were mounted on a turntable that allowed the dipoles to be turned in any direction. By rotating the antennas, you could determine what direction the radio signal was coming from. Jansky's merry-go-round, as it was nicknamed, was designed to receive radio waves at a frequency of 20 and a half megahertz, equivalent to a wavelength of about 14 and a half meters. After recording signals from all directions in the sky for several months, Jansky identified three types of static. Nearby thunderstorms, distant thunderstorms, and radio hiss originating from the center of the Milky Way. In 1937, another electrical engineer, Grota Reber, built the first parabolic radio telescope in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois. Can you imagine that as your backyard telescope? <laughs> That's phenomenal. <laughs> and uh, it's now at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory's Green Bank, West Virginia site. Reber spent more than a decade in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois, mapping the radio emission from the Milky Way at a frequency of 160 megahertz, or 1.8 meters, a little over six feet wavelength and at 480 megahertz, six-tenths of a meter, or about two foot in wavelength. And um, the inset in the uh, top here shows those two maps of the Milky Way at radio wavelengths that he made. The emission mechanism responsible for the galactic radio emission that Reber mapped were free electrons accelerated in the galaxy's magnetic field. This is called synchrotron radiation. Now, here is a diagram of Earth's atmospheric windows. Wavelengths at which electromagnetic radiation will penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. There are only two regions of the entire electromagnetic spectrum which can be completely transparent through the Earth's atmosphere. Both are indicated by the white arrows. One is uh, the visible optical wavelength. That's where our eyes are sensitive. And the other is uh, radio wavelengths out there. It's also the case um, that that's why SETI searches are being conducted principally in the radio because radio wavelengths can get not only through our atmosphere but actually through the interstellar dust um, and you know from galaxy to galaxy. Um, so it it's also the case that the interstellar medium, as I said, about which we will learn quite a bit more, is the most transparent at the longest, that is at radio wavelengths. Chemical notation in this, which you probably can't read, but there's oxygen, water, carbon dioxide. Um, all those molecules are <coughs> absorbing at all those different wavelengths. So, Basically, the Earth's atmosphere is opaque at those wavelengths. 
And this also illustrates why we need high and dry sites to do millimeter and submillimeter astronomy. Because um, the millimeter is right here. And so not all of it gets transmitted through um, our atmosphere. So 1951 saw the discovery of the 21 centimeter line of interstellar atomic hydrogen at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz by Ewan and Purcell. The existence of this spectral line of atomic hydrogen had been predicted as far back as 1944 by Dutch astronomer Van der Hulst. This same Purcell, co-discoverer of the radio emission from interstellar galactic atomic hydrogen gas, shared a Nobel Physics Prize for the discovery of what's called nuclear magnetic resonance. NMR, as it's known, is the principle behind the medical imaging technique known as MRI, which stands for Magnetic <laughs> Resonance Imaging. The nuclear descriptor was intentionally dropped to not frighten people away from its use. <laughs> anyway, it's interesting that um, you know, he won the no Nobel Physics Prize for something completely different, yet he made it this very major discovery in radio astronomy. 1963 was the year the first interstellar molecule, OH, was discovered at 1.6 gigahertz or 18 centimeter wavelength in the radio. Then in um, 1967, Charlie Towns, who was later awarded the Physics Nobel Prize for the discovery of the laser, arrived at UC Berkeley. He was, in his own words, determined to move toward astronomy in the infrared and radio wave regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. He writes, The general feeling among astronomers seemed to be that OH and the other three, ra three radicals that had been found in space, namely C and CH and CH+, were all there was. The idea that gas densities are so low in nebulae and ultraviolet radiation so intense that any normal molecules surviving would be too scarce to be detectable. No one seemed to be taking seriously my discussion in 1955 of the variety of molecules that might be detected. I figured it merited at least a look. In addition, my reading about radio measurements of hydrogen atoms in interstellar clouds had turned up a couple of discussions about interstellar dust clouds in which no atomic hydrogen was seen at all like that B68 globule I showed you earlier. It was amazing that the clouds contained dust particles, but no atomic materials. There was a little speculation that in those peculiar cases, the hydrogen was molecular, that two or more hydrogen atoms were combined, but that seemed not to be taken seriously by most of the astronomical community. However, Tommy Gold and Fritz Vicky Two astronomers who have produced many radical but interesting ideas both made the claim in 1961 that molecular hydrogen was probably common. My thought was that if indeed hydrogen was forming molecules in space, why not other combinations of atoms? The first molecular candidates I had in mind included ammonia, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and a few others. Jack Welch, an important figure in the radio astronomy group at Berkeley, suggested the use of a 20-foot or 6-meter antenna at Hat Creek Observatory, which was just being completed and said he'd help me get started. It would be the new telescope's first project. Despite his particular interest and generosity, I got the feeling that most of the Berkeley astronomers thought my idea was a little wild. Ed Purcell, remember he's the one who discovered the atomic hydrogen line, was so sure that ammonia would not show up that he talked his graduate student at Harvard out of trying. He figured that if any ammonia did exist out there, collisions between molecules would be so rare that ammonia would be in thermal equilibrium with the cold background radiation of space and be virtually undetectable. Ed's logic was completely sound. But his basic assumption that all interstellar clouds would be of very low density, such as had been found with the 21 centimeter hydrogen line, and hence collisions would be too rare, turned out to be quite wrong. And that's why I have this quote up here. What gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> so, 
Townsend's postdoc at Berkeley, Al Chung, discovered the 22 gigahertz 1.3 centimeter emission line from the ammonia molecule in 1968. Finding this radio emission from ammonia refuted the generally accepted idea that no interstellar clouds were very dense. Instead of densities of 1 to 10 atoms per cubic centimeter, implied by the measurements of the 21 centimeter hydrogen line and presumed to apply everywhere, there had to be more than a thousand molecules per cubic centimeter in the clouds where you see molecular um, gas. Only such densities could provide enough collisions with hydrogen molecules to excite ammonia to the extent implied by the radiation we measured. Such densities are still lower than the best vacuum that we have produced on Earth, but much higher than gas densities that were generally anticipated in space. That much gas plus dust located in the same interstellar clouds was adequate to shield molecules in the inner parts of the clouds from UV radiation that otherwise would tear the molecules apart. So thus I'm showing you um, three millimeter wave telescopes here that uh, basically um, do most of their work um, mapping molecules in interstellar space because our molecules emit mostly uh, at that low temperature in the millimeter. What molecules to look for next? There were no obvious easy targets. The carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide molecules produce spectral lines at wavelengths of only a few millimeters or shorter. They would take some special effort because there was no existing equipment suited to work at millimeter wavelengths. However, back at Bell Labs in Holmdel, New Jersey, two radio astronomers, whom you might heard of, Arno, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson, were hired to do research on long distance communication. Bell Labs were constantly pushing technology to higher frequencies to get more bandwidth. It was in the course of this technological push that Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation for which, as you know, they received a Nobel Prize. However, as Bob Wilson writes, after the initial excitement of discovering the cosmic microwave background had died down, our lab director called Arno and me in and reminded us that our initial agreement had been that we would each spend half time on astronomy and the other half on work for the Bell system. And it was time to do some of the latter. <laughs> We each took on communications projects, and our centimeter wave astronomy work slowed down. In the meantime, National Radio Astronomy astronomer Frank Drake, of the famous Drake Equation for SETI, developed an interest in extending the wavelength coverage of NRAO's instruments to shorter wavelengths than radio. He recruited Frank Lowe at Texas Instruments in Dallas, who was working on liquid helium-cooled geranium bolometers that could be used as millimeter wave receivers. Together, they began millimeter wave ex experiments and soon realized they needed a large telescope at a dry site, resulting in a proposal for and construction of NRAO's 12-meter purpose-built millimeter wave telescope. Sorry, I'm going to go back there. That's the, sorry, that's the 12-meter. That actually is still uh, at Kid Peak in Arizona. Um, whoops. However, okay, so there were Arno Penzias working on technology. Here they built this 12 meter purpose built for detecting millimeter waves. And then using the technology developed by Penzias, Wilson, and others at Bell Labs, mounted on the new 12 meter millimeter wave telescope resulted in the discovery of the 115 gigahertz or 2.6 millimeter spectral line of the CO molecule in Orion. Orion being the strongest CO or carbon monoxide emission source in the sky in 1970. And here on the slide I'm showing you the newest map as of May of 2018 of the millimeter wave emission from the CO molecule in the Orion A molecular cloud. Um, and let's see here. 
Each of the three colors, red, green, and blue, represents a different line of sight velocity at a distance of about 1,300 light years or 410 parsecs. The Orion giant molecular clouds are the closest example of massive star formation to Earth in our galaxy. Orion A uh, molecular cloud contains both high and low mass young stellar objects and hosts a variety of star forming environments, <coughs> including dense star clusters similar to the one where Earth's sun is believed to have formed. And I just want to uh, show you in the inset here that structure is the Orion A molecular cloud, which you see in exquisite detail in, this, in the larger image. And um, if you can make out the stars of Orion, there, and the bell. <coughs> so to give you a sort of a sense of where this cloud is on the sky. And this giant molecular cloud, actually the two of them together, Orion A and Orion B, um, contain about 200,000 solar masses of gas and, as I said, are the nearest uh, example of massive star formation to Earth. Okay, the sites of star formation are where stars form. So 90% of the Milky Way's 10 to the 12, that's trillion solar masses, is dark matter, which interacts gravitationally, but not electromagnetically. We do not know what dark matter is yet, Maybe we'll hear more in the next talk. 98% of the remaining few hundred billion solar masses of our galaxy is in the form of luminous matter, i.e. stars. Thus, most of the stars that will ever form in our galaxy already have. There are just a few billion solar masses of interstellar gas and a few tens of millions of solar masses of interstellar dust left over from which to form new stars. So here's a dark sky, which unfortunately we don't get enough of, <laughs> unless you go far away from cities. You can see our galaxy, the Milky Way, this is over uh, Death Valley. In fact, the etymology of our word galaxy is from the Greek via loctica, meaning Milky Way, since all of the unresolved stars by our eyes seem to be blended into fuzzy white or Milky Way. Light pollution now prevents most people from experiencing the wonders of a dark night sky such as can be seen, as I mentioned, from Death Valley. In this picture from the National Park Service, note the dust lanes throughout. Which block the background starlight. So since we all live in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy's disk at a distance of 27,400 light, 400 light years or 8.4 kiloparsecs from the galactic center, we can never observe our own galaxy face on as pictured in this artist's rendition of what our Milky Way might look like to a distant extragalactic observer whose line of sight happens to be oriented in such a way that our galaxy would appear to be face on from their viewpoint. Specifically, this face-on view is useful for defining galactic longitude. Galactic longitude is measured from the sun's location. Zero longitude is along the line joining the sun with the galactic center. So here we are. There's the galactic center. So that's zero galactic longitude. And looking at the anti-center outwards from the sun, that's uh, 180 degrees, and then 90 and 270. Uh, what am I doing? Right here. Yeah. There's 90. And that one is 270. So when you see the projections of the galaxy in some of these following um, slides, those are the coordinates that we use for um, looking at the galaxy. We're in the plane of the galaxy, as you know. So this is an optical, red, green, blue, all-sky mosaic, in a projection such that the direction from the sun towards the galactic center is in the middle of the image. 
right around there. Dark dust lanes are mixed with cold molecular hydrogen gas. Stars are currently forming in some of these regions as labeled. So we'll look a little more at, uh, there's Ophiuchus, there's uh, Taurus out there, and a few um, high mass star forming regions like there. These are um, radio uh, regions of ionized hydrogen, and um, you have the small and large Magellanic clouds down there. And there are Orion A and B. So because you're amateur or you're astronomers, uh, I, I'll tell you how this um, image was produced because uh, these images took over a time were took over 21 months to uh, acquire from dark sky locations in South Africa, Texas, and Michigan um, in 70 fields, each covering 40 by 27 degrees uh, using a camera. And uh, the image scale is 36 arc seconds per pixel and had a limiting magnitude of approximately 14. So this took quite some doing, just so you appreciate that. So, the interstellar matter of our Milky Way and of other galaxies consists of low density gas and dust. As we'll see, the interstellar gas consists of cool molecular hydrogen clouds embedded in hotter, more tenuous intercloud <coughs> atomic hydrogen gas, which in turn is embedded in even hotter, even more tenuous ionized gas. The interstellar medium reflects, absorbs, and emits radiation. So, interstellar space is not entirely empty. 99% of the interstellar medium is a very low density gas. How low in density is it? Well, the air we breathe has a density of approximately 10 to the 19 molecules per cubic centimeter, which is about a milliliter. By contrast, the lowest density regions of interstellar space contain about 0.1, a tenth of an atom per cubic centimeter. The remaining 1% of the interstellar medium consists of dust. That's right, dust. Like the stuff that accumulates on your bookshelves and under your bed. <laughs> the properties of interstellar dust are that its composition is carbon, metal, silicates, and ice. Its size ranges from 500 nanometers or less in diameter. Uh, and there's about one per one dust moat per million cubic meters. That's like having one dust moat floating around in a large football stadium. And that's what does all the absorbing absorbing of the background starlight because it's just such vast distances and volumes. Interstellar gas consists of cool dust cloud uh, cool clouds for, uh, embedded in hot intercloud gas. Half the interstellar gas is compressed into only 2% of our galaxy's volume. These relatively high density regions are called clouds or nebulae. The densest nebulae can have densities of 10,000 molecules per cubic centimeter. The coolest nebulae can have temperatures of 10 Kelvin or less. That's colder than midnight on Pluto. The other half of the interstellar gas is spread over the remaining 98% of the galaxy's volume. The lowest density gas has, as I said, the density of 0.1 atoms per cubic centimeter. And the hottest interstellar gas has a temperature of 8,000 Kelvin, which is hotter than the sun. So this is a spectacular map of that 21 centimeter line whose discovery I told you about of the Milky Way in atomic hydrogen emission. It was um, assembled by observations using the Effelsberg 100 meter radio telescope near Bonn, Germany for the Northern Hemisphere and the 64 meter Parkes radio telescope in Australia. Okay. 
So, the atomic hydrogen component of our galaxy has a mass of about 4.3 billion suns within a radius of about 60,000 light years from the sun. Now this took decades to make. This is the Milky Way's molecular hydrogenous traced by the CO molecule, whose discovery um, I told you about. And this map was made with two small telescopes of 1.2 meter aperture working in the millimeter. That one on the roof of Harvard, um, Smithsonian Astrophysics uh, Observatory, and the other one down in Chile. It's twin to get the southern sky. And so this is the molecular hydrogen emission, well, as traced by CO, of our galactic plane. What does that mean? Question? What does, what does that mean? Uh, okay, hydrogen? what it means is that, um, so 90% of all the gas, everything out there is hydrogen, and 10% is helium, and the rest is trace, like a part in a million, a part in a hundred thousand. And molecular hydrogen, H2, the molecule itself, has no transitions because it's, uh, for quantum mechanical reasons, that atoms are identical. So, and it has no transitions in the millimeter or submillimeter. So the way we know it's there is the molecular hydrogen collides with carbon monoxide molecules and excites them to rotate, and then when they emit a photon, a millimeter photon, that's this what uh, that's this um, spectral line that we see. Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay, great. That's what I mean by tracer. So it's the most observed um, molecular tracer in millimeter astronomy. The CO, and it's and it's higher rotational transitions. Yes. Uh, molecular hydrogen is. Uh uh, H2? Correct. Two hydrogen atoms bonded into a molecule, yes. So when we refer to molecular clouds in our galaxy or in other galaxies, we're referring to their molecular hydrogen content. The gas is in general much colder <coughs> and denser than the atomic hydrogen component. A large fraction of the interstellar gas in a spiral galaxy such as ours is molecular hydrogen, and much of that is contained in the giant molecular clouds, objects with masses of 10,000 to a million suns and sizes of 50 to 200 parsecs. The simple, stable, well, I just answered the question, diatomic molecule carbon monoxide has played an essential role in the study of galactic molecular clouds and molecular gas in space generally because H2 itself devoid of a permanent electric dipole moment is almost impossible to observe directly in the cold, generally obscured interstellar regions where molecules form and survive. The lower frequency rotational transitions of CO, in contrast, are readily observed even in quite tenuous molecular gas, and the lowest of these, the 1 to 0 rotational transition at 115 gigahertz, has become to the radio astronomer, the closest molecular analog to the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen for the study of the interstellar medium. No molecular cloud is free of CO emission, which is generally the most easily observed molecular line, and giant molecular clouds throughout the Milky Way can be detected in this line even with a small telescope, such as these. Carbon monoxide surveys play a crucial role in many studies of star formation and galactic structure. In conjunction with radio continuum, infrared, and optical observations of ionized hydrogen regions, OB associations, and so forth. These observations have demonstrated that virtually all star formation occurs in molecular clouds and high-resolution CO observations of dense cloud cores and molecular outflows have contributed greatly to our understanding of how stars form. So, here are some examples. Here are some pretty images from a large team of astronomers who are using ALMA 
to map the molecular gas in nearby spiral galaxies to learn more about star formation processes on galactic scales. So here we see optical image on the left. We see a mid-infrared image from the Spitzer Space Observatory in the middle. And we see this millimeter CO2 to 1 image of the same galaxy taken with ALMA. So recently, it's not even published yet. So I got this from a conference I just attended a couple of years ago where they showed actually dozens of images like this. And I said, oh, can I have some of these? And they were kind enough, Melanie Chavance was kind enough to put together a few slides uh, so you could see these. And FANG stands for Physics at High Angular Resolution in Nearby Galaxies. It's a team, international team of a large number of uh, investigators imaging um, nearby galaxies in CO2 to 1 with ALMA, and then you can compare with the optical and infrared and other um, images at different wavelengths, and you can start to understand star formation on galactic scales. Wow. So it's uh, pretty cool. So those are giant molecular clouds. Uh, traced out in other galaxies. Okay, the red regions in this optical image of N83 show what are referred to as giant H2 regions. So all these red <coughs> places. Yes? Before you leave the subject of uh, the gas. Yes. Hydrogen in particular. As time goes by, do, do, does the atomic hydrogen form into molecular or does the molecular get broken up into atomic? Beautiful question. Both. Both both occur. The um, molecular, in fact, what these people are finding, I wasn't going to go into it, but they're finding that these molecular clouds actually break up after. 13-ish million years, plus or minus two million, depending on the galaxy and the environment, because of um, star formation within them. And then, yes, that was a little bit of a controversy over one of the poster breaks was someone else said, but then the atomic hydrogen has to reform into molecular on a short time scale, and that was an unresolved argument. <laughs> so both, both processes do occur. Uh, we have nowhere, we don't have an instrument that can observe atomic hydrogen at this kind of resolution because its wavelength is so much longer, so you need spacing. Who wins? The, the, the molecular or the atomic? In what sense do you mean who wins? Well, both, both processes are going back, but one might be stronger than the other. Um, there's, uh, all we can say is the total amount of gas in atomic hydrogen is quite a bit more than the amount that's observed in molecular. Like 90% atomic versus 10% molecular, say. Did that answer your question? Great. So, going on to the ionized component, that's all the little red parts here, and they're red because um, ionized hydrogen, when it recombines into atomic, emits a certain wavelength of light in the red that's known as hydrogen alpha emission. And this kind of emission is excited uh, by hundreds of O and B stars that ionize and destroy their immediate surroundings. Uh, these regions also uh, are Re regions of very recent star formation, recent meaning a few million years, because the most massive stars, like O and B stars, have such short lifetimes of order of a few million years, in contrast to lower mass stars like our sun, which, of course, we know live for billions of years. 
So by studying the relative distribution of the ionized hydrogen regions, the dust, and the associated molecular gas, we could learn about star formation on galactic scales. So star formation is kind of a difficult problem in that it involves a large range of distance or length scales, as depicted in this slide. On the left is a Hubble Space Telescope image of the M51 spiral galaxy, and then zooming out is a typical giant molecular cloud scale, which in this case is the Orion A molecular cloud you've seen already. And then uh, going out from that, you see at an even smaller scale, um, the Orion A molecular sorry, the um, Orion Nebula Cluster, as seen by Spitzer Space Telescope in the mid-infrared. Oh, and then in here, that's, this little bit is this part. Um, on a scale of a few light years, you see um, millimeter emission taken with the, mapped with the um, GBT, that's the, Green Bank Telescope, at the three millimeter dust, and then the little circles mark dense cores of order a tenth of a parsec in which stars are forming. So you have all these length scales. And here's an image of the nearest uh, high mass star forming region to Earth. That's the um, Orion Nebula Cluster both in the optical and as seen by Spitzer. And I'm... I see, so... However, regions where lower mass stars are forming, such as the Ophiuchus star cloud pictured here, contain just a few thousand solar masses of gas and are much closer to Earth, so therefore amenable to much more detailed study than even Orion, which is the closest example of high mass star formation. So for this reason, the remainder of my talk will be focused on the processes involved in low mass star formation. And by the way, as you may know, the vast majority of the stars in our galaxy are low mass, with more than 70% having masses of just a tenth of the sun's mass. So, optical image, near infrared image. So you see, you can't see through <laughs> at the visible wavelength. And you can see a little bit more through the near infrared. Um, but e where the white arrow is, even in the near infrared, you cannot see. And that's where we um, discovered at sub-millimeter wavelengths 25 years ago the first protostar with that instrument, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope. So ALMA, as well as the large single-dish submillimeter telescopes pictured here, is a radio telescope that is tuned to higher frequencies of radio waves. Uh, most objects in the universe can radiate this kind of energy, so the ability to detect light at these wavelengths has been a goal for astronomers for decades. When they made the science case to build that telescope to uh, the British government, um, the top two uh, scientific um, goals were observations of molecular lines and of emission from dust. The focus was on galactic clouds, but the prospect of extragalactic research did get a mention. So, this kind of radiation that I showed you in the atmospheric transmission 
needs a high and dry site because some molecules in our atmosphere, like namely water, absorb submillimeter emission. So that's why these two telescopes, the Caltech Submillimeter Observatory called CSO and the JCMT were built atop Mount Akea, which is at 13,400 feet. Uh, very little oxygen, I can assure you. <laughs> Need them less water. The, furthermore, the surfaces of these antennas had to be smooth at a level of 30 microns over their entire extents in order to properly focus the light at 350 microns. CSO ev eventually achieved a 20 micron surface accuracy over 10.4 meters, JCMT 24 micron um, smoothness over the entire surface of that. So unfortunately, CSO has been taken down, but JCMT is still being operated by a consortium called the East Asia Observatory, which is a Hawaiian nonprofit. <laughs> so here are images from that telescope of the first proto star in some pre-stellar cores. Um, right there's the proto star at 800 microns. 350 microns, 450 microns. And this image was taken with the Iran 30 meter telescope um, at 1.3 millimeters. And there's a bipolar outflow emanating from it, which was actually discovered first. That's blue shift, sorry, that's red shifted gas going away from us. And that's blue shifted gas coming towards us, and that was mapped in the CO molecule. And just to show you uh, the kind of progress that's been made, um, here's an ALMA image of this little bit here. And that's showing um, the outflow directions, and it turns out that we have at least a binary system with two little disks that are each like 40 astronomical units across. So this is absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> okay, so here we have an artist's conception of the currently understood phases of the formation of the low mass stellar system and its attendant planetary system. We start from a dense core, which were like the little uh, yellow circles shown in the inset from the Orion um, uh, cloud earlier. So a order tenth of a parsec and containing a few solar masses. If the conditions are just right, the, the gas gravitationally collapses and forms an actively accreting protostar over there. Those inevitably drive bipolar outflows. The envelope is falling onto an accretion disk and the mass is accreted onto the central object through the disk from the envelope. Eventually, um, the outflow subsides, the envelope um, dis is dissipated, and uh, you get this stage. And then eventually, even the gas, the disk, dissipates and you basically form a planetary system orbiting a pre-main sequence star. So this is showing you another example of a protostar as it appears at visible near infrared and near sorry mid-infrared wavelengths and in the millimeter emission of the CO molecule. Down there that was done with Alma. The red ship the red uh, refers to gas that's moving away from us. The blue is gas that's moving towards us. And when you combine all of those images, you get the image that was on the title slide. So why do we do interferometry? Can I have a question? Yes. In, in the two slides ago, I, I didn't, you have that bipolar flow. Yes. What shuts it off? Um, because the envelope material um, is all used up, 
and that stops accretion, and once accretion stops, the um, outflow stops. Well, you still have enough mass to form planets. Yes, planets are like a minuscule percent of like the central star's mass. Like, um, okay, maybe a thousandth of a solar mass is, it's very small, right? Thank you for the question. So why interferometry? Because it allows us to image detail equivalent to that of a filled aperture single telescope of a diameter equal to the greatest separation between the individual antennas. And it's completely impractical to build such large single dish antennas. So I'll show you another protostellar system going from large scale to small. Um, this was some giant molecular outflows from protostars in the Perseus molecular cloud that we imaged with the 12 meter telescope in CO1 to zero. All the um, stars show locations of protostars. The red contours show flows that are moving away from us. The blue contours flows that are moving towards us. There's a inset of centered on there of what was originally mapped with the Iran 30 meter telescope as the outflow from that central source. But I'd like you to pay attention to that little source up there. So this is the Spitzer mid-infrared image of the same region. Again, note that little region. That's what we will see um, imaged with Alma. <gasps> oh, there we go. <laughs> That's better. So it, this is an absolutely stunning image of a protostar. It shows a close binary which totals one solar mass buried in a massive, meaning about a tenth of a solar mass circumbinary disk. Usually they're of order a hundredth of a solar mass, but this one is a tenth. And it exhibits spiral structure and it's fragmenting gravitationally to produce a brown dwarf. That's an object less than eight hundredth of a solar mass. But that's what appears as the brightest object at these wavelengths. So that's a uh, an image of gravitational instability forming a brown dwarf in a protostar. It's just, wow. <laughs> okay. So here's another um, young object called uh, HL tau. So first I'm showing you the optical image. Um, this is a Taurus molecular cloud, which you can see there's some of the dust absorbing the background starlight, and then um, zeroing in on its immediate vicinity. There's that source, HL tau, and this is all my image of the outflow from this young object. The red is gas going away from us, the blue is gas coming towards us, and at the center is a little dip. And I'm just going to show you what the Owens Valley Radio Observatory on which I did my thesis looked like. They're, the telescopes are parked. <laughs> and that was the control room. And the reason I'm showing you this is to show you the image of that HL tau object from the previous slide as imaged by these three millimeter telescopes back in 1987. Now we have the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, which came online in 2011. And when it looks at HL tau, that's what it sees. So that was with <laughs> Ofro, <laughs> and this is now. And this is not just a two point 
9 millimeters, but at 1.3 millimeters, 870 microns, and then they've actually combined to different frequencies to show structure in the dust. And it's such that where you see dark here, there, um, even millimeter light can't get through, it's so opaque. So you need to go to even longer wavelengths approaching a centimeter in order to see through the disc there. And this is showing you uh, Google Maps <laughs> of the what's now called the Jansky Very Large Array <laughs> because it had a huge upgrade uh, in 2012 to its receivers. It can now um, image at seven millimeters. And when it looks at this source, it can see through those opaque regions in the submillimeter, because it's, it's at 7 millimeters, not at 0.87 millimeters. And in the inner regions there, look at the scale. 14 astronomical units. Saturn's distance from the Sun is of order 10 astronomical units. So that's the scale we're looking at. And this little clump here um, has a few Earth masses, and it's thought to be perhaps a protoplanet. So when you combine both images together, that's the result. And I will end there. Thank you for your attention. It's about 310 parsecs, so multiply by 3.3, so about a thousand light years. Yes? I understand that there's a big temperature difference, but is there any way you can modify the technology to pick up images uh, of uh, actually formed stars and planet exostar, exoplanets? Oh, that's the next <laughs> few decades. <laughs> Is the problem the temperature differential? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's one problem and also the very faintness. See, when planets like this are young, or stars are young, uh, things that are substellar, they're way brighter than when they get older. So, like the proto-Earth was so hot that that's why we still have plate tectonics because the Earth is, apart from the radioactivity, which is 40% of the heat coming from the Earth's interior, the rest is the Earth is still cooling off wow. from its formation. And it's such, you know, the rock is such good insulator that the heat is still in there. Um, so things are very hot when they first form, so they radiate more so we can see them better. By the time they get as old as the exoplanets that are being discovered, they're so dim that it's a huge effort. It's, it's really but is there, what's the hole? Um, people are working on it. Like with um, the James Webb Space Telescope, that's going to go up very soon. Uh, one of the big projects is to look at transiting planets with it and take a spectrum. Uh, you know, because you know the period, you know when it's in transit and when not, so you can subtract off um, the stellar plus planet spectrum or minus just the star spectrum when the planet is behind the um, star and hopefully get some information on the planet's atmosphere. So, yes, yes. Yes, you. Uh, I have a question about that brown dwarf. So yes. 
I've heard that if, uh, if Jupiter had been a little more massive, it could have been a brown dwarf. So how common is it that, this, that, that stars come out of the protoplanetary disk and then what happens to them? Do they become binary stars or...? Okay, there's a lot of questions going on. So let's start with one of them. So the first one was about a brown dwarf and the difference between a brown dwarf and a planet. Was that right? Kind of. Okay, so the cutoff is about 13 Jupiter masses between brown dwarf and a planet. The reason being that deuterium doesn't fuse with uh, solar composition for masses uh, lower than 13 Jupiter masses. Whereas higher than 13 Jupiter masses, you can have deuterium fusing. And so that's what happens in the early stages of a brown dwarf. Eventually it runs out and they just keep cooling down. Now, the other questions have to do with multiple formation. Uh, yeah. Okay, that is a huge topic. Okay, I didn't go into it because there's not enough time. But it seems now that most protostars actually are forming in small groupings, not just like a single object. And we're still trying to understand how that works. So that's still an unsolved mystery. Yes, up in the corner. What is the darker ring? Those are places where there's way less dust. And so, in fact, some people are doing modeling um, with supercomputers to try and reproduce that kind of an appearance, perhaps with planets that are sweeping out the dust. Um, so that, that awaits more modeling. Um, when the uh, gas is collapsing in and, as, and the, the disk forms? Yes. Do we know anything about what determines the orientation of the disk or does it seem to be kind of random? Or? That's an excellent question. It basically has to do with the angular momentum of the stuff that's falling in. So, yeah. Yes? Um, <clears throat> does this give any insight into how star formation starts since gas just tends to sit there. And um, and also, I got into an argument with somebody that said, uh, I said gas and dust are involved in star formation, and he said, no, it's gas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since dust well, seems to be everywhere, you know. Uh, okay, there's two questions. What was the first one that I already The first one was what starts okay. the start Okay, okay. So basically, I didn't, again, didn't have time to go into this, but the interstellar medium is supersonically turbulent. It's a mess. And it turned, and there are gorgeous images of it from Herschel Space Telescope. That's a whole other talk. So it's a turbulent mess. <laughs> and most of it doesn't collapse. It's very rare that you get the circumstances exactly just so that collapse happens, and how that's initiated is still under debate, whether it's shocks that are moving together in just the right way, uh, or exactly there's mag magnetic effects. I mean, there's, it's, that's still research of, of how the collapse actually initiates. The second question was? Gas and dust or just Ah, yes. Okay, so in our galaxy, it's about 1% dust by mass and 99% gas. Um, now, when you start to think about star formation in the very early universe, before the first supernovae went off, when there's only hydrogen and helium gas, then your friend... Yeah. <laughs> One of your slides, you were talking about uh, one of the dishes. I think it was yeah. 30, or I don't know. You're on 30 meter? Yeah. What, you, what you're saying is the surface was perfect within 30 microns. Yes. Does that mean that for the theoretical perfect shape, the, the surface didn't deviate? Into Correct. It? How do they do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other talk, and I'm, I can't answer that. Scrubbing bubble. Scrubbing bubble. Yes. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it's like it's like the, you make the surface of your telescope. I mean, but I, I can't. I I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. Yes. 
Well, it, it seems um, um, that um, um, it's most probable that there must be more planets than there are stars. It, it's as yes. If, it's as if um, um, stellar formation, or I should say planetary formation, mm -hmm. is a byproduct. Yes, of absolutely. Stellar formation. That's exactly right. We're just kind of like the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. More questions? Okay. 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 Okay.